Hello, my name is Tom Clendon and I am the ACCA SBR online lecturer. Now, this podcast is about current issues. This podcast is about discussing some of the limitations around the accounting treatment for goodwill as laid out in IFRS 3 business combinations. And I think it's relevant to point out that accounting standards in practice are not perfect. And so we need to be aware of some of the criticisms that have been levied against them from a conceptual theoretical point of view. And I've got four. Now, first of all, let's just recap on the basic accounting treatment for goodwill. Purchase goodwill is recognized as an intangible asset and is subject to an annual impairment review. That's the basic accounting treatment for goodwill. Purchase goodwill is accounted for as an intangible asset and subject to an annual impairment review. Criticism number one, goodwill is not an asset. When I was a student, I was taught that goodwill was not an asset and any goodwill that arose was immediately written off against the debt. But that's back in the day. Why isn't goodwill regarded as an asset? Well, strictly speaking, if we think about inherent goodwill, inherent goodwill is not regarded as an asset. It's prohibited from being recognised. And for good reason, too, because your own goodwill, your inherent goodwill, your non-purchase goodwill is not underpinned by a transaction. There's no reliable measure of that goodwill. And arguably, you don't control it anyway. And the definition of an asset is based on control. So not all goodwill is an asset. It's only purchase goodwill that we account for as an asset. Now, I can see that there is an underlying transaction and I can see there's a a reliable measure with purchase goodwill. But I do still fundamentally question whether or not we control the purchase goodwill or whether that goodwill could slip through our fingers so easily. Do we control our own reputation? Do we control our staff? Do we control our loyal customers? Because that's what makes up the goodwill. The loyal customers, the loyal staff, the positive reputation. And those things are not always necessarily inside of our control. And the standard almost admits as much. It it calls goodwill a bridge, a bridge between the cost of the investment and the underlying net assets that we've bought. So observation number one, criticism of the standard number one, is goodwill really an asset? And there's a bit of a debate around that. Criticism number two. Now, the accounting standard requires that goodwill is subject to an annual impairment review. Now, that's quite a lot of hassle because you have to attach the goodwill to a cash generating unit because goodwill on its own can't be sold. Goodwill on its own doesn't generate any revenue. So you've got to look to identify an independent set of a a, a collection of net assets that generates an independent income stream. And what will happen when you do an impairment review of that CGU that includes the goodwill is that most years, no loss, no loss, no loss, no loss. And then suddenly there'll be a cliff top. Suddenly there will be a catastrophic event. Wham, bam a loss is created. Now, what that means is the earnings are volatile. They're good, they're good, they're good, they're good. Bang, they then fall. The markets don't like that. The fundamental characteristic of useful information is it's got to be relevant, so it's got to be predictive. And you can argue that impairment reviews don't create predictive profits. They create fluctuations. You can make that argument. Um, You can also make other criticisms 
that support the idea that impairment review is the wrong thing to do. Goodwill is made up of the staff, the customers, the reputation. Now those staff over time change. Those customers over time change. And a well-run business will recruit new staff and new customers. So when we come to do a review, an impairment review, we find in year one, in year two, in year three, in year four, that the goodwill is maintained, that there isn't an impairment loss. But I think what is really happening is the existing goodwill of the business when you bought it is naturally in decline because those staff leave, those customers leave, but they're being gradually replaced with new customers and new staff. So 10 years later, you could have had 10 years of impeccable impairment reviews, but the goodwill that existed on the day of acquisition has gone, but through the back door, it's been replaced with new inherent goodwill. So the fact you do an annual impairment review of goodwill ignores the dissipation of the purchase goodwill. It can be argued that goodwill should be systematically written off over a predetermined period. 10 years, 20 years. I mean, that's what they do in UK GAT. That's what they do for small and medium sized companies. They say, sod it, we're not interested in the cost and hassle and subjectivity of an impairment review. Let's just systematically write it off. So there is a powerful argument for amortizing purchased goodwill instead of leaving it subject to an annual impairment review. Criticism number one. Goodwill is not an asset. Criticism number two, goodwill should not be subject to an impairment review and should be amortized. Criticism number three. Normally goodwill is positive. Normally goodwill is an asset. Normally goodwill is a premium. We pay a premium. The consideration is more than the net asset. And that extra consideration over and above the net assets that we bought is the, the reputation, the goodwill of the business. But it can be the case where we have negative goodwill. It can be the case where there's a bargain purchase and we acquire the net assets at a discount. So if the net assets are 100 and we buy 100% of the business for only 80, so the investment is 80. There's no NCI because we bought 100%. The net assets are 100. Hey, instead of there being a premium, we bought them at a discount. Now, the standard says in that situation, double check. In that situation, is the fair value of the net assets really 100? Because it's very odd that you can buy them for 80. But if you're convinced, then you would recognize negative goodwill of 20. Now, if positive goodwill is an asset, is a debit, you might think that negative goodwill is a liability. No, 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 there's no obligation, it's not a liability. What the standard requires is that it's shown as a profit, that it's recognized immediately in the P&L. And that's where I have a slight problem. That's where you could make a critical analysis of the standard. Why is it in profit? It's not recurring. It's not operating. It's not realized. Surely it feels better to put it in the dustbin that is other comprehensive income. Surely it feels better to put it in equity, to put it in OCI, to put it not to put it in the P&L but to put it amongst all the other odds and sods and revaluations and weird stuff that we relegate to other comprehensive income. It seems strange to put it, to boost the earnings per share, to boost the profits when it's one off, unrealized, not cash, not operating. So there's a curiosity there around the accounting treatment of negative goodwill. And, you know, picking up on that, Moving on to point number four, criticism number four, non-controlling interest. When we calculate goodwill, 
we have to have the investment, the controlling interest at fair value. We have to have the net assets, the date of acquisition at fair value. But there's a choice for NCI. It can be at fair value or it can be as a proportion of net assets. And this choice can be made on an acquisition by acquisition basis. I find that strange. If I own property, if I own a couple of properties, both properties must either be under ISA 16 at cost or fair value. I don't have a choice on a property by property basis. So there's an inconsistency there, I think. Well, there's just a general inconsistency that one company can buy a sub and measure the NCI at fair value. Another company could buy, in theory, an identical sub, measure it at, measure the NCI as a proportion of net assets. And what's the poor user going to make of that? Because, because NCI is different, goodwill is different. And because goodwill is different, the impairment loss that arises subsequently is also going to be different. Not because there's a difference in the underlying transaction, but because of the accounting treatment, the accounting policy that has been made by the accountant at the date of acquisition. If it were me, I would have NCI always measured at fair value because that's consistent with an NCI. It means you've got full goodwill. So you're consolidating all of the goodwill, just like you consolidate all of the plant of the sub and all of the infantry of the sub. The terrible thing about measuring NCI as a proportion of net assets, not only is it complicated when you do an impairment review, grossing up and all that malarkey, but it means the goodwill is attributable to the parent only. And that is horribly inconsistent with the way that the other assets of the subsidiary are consolidated. Wow. No accounting standard is perfect. And one is complicated as dealing with goodwill and IFRS 3 attracts its fair amount of criticisms. And I hope I've enlightened you into some of those in that, in, in that way of thinking. Clearly, you only bring these criticisms up if you're asked about them. You must make sure you answer the question. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, there's plenty of others uh, in this series. Uh, my name is Tom Clendon. Please subscribe, like and follow this podcast. And if you are interested in online courses with me to help you pass SBR, please get in touch through my website, www.tomclendon.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening.